Another thing I'm very passionate about that I spend a lot of time doing is working on diversity and inclusion so that people like me don't have such a difficult journey to get from where they are to where they'd like to be. So, I mean, the overview is, I think ambition is evenly distributed, access to capital, uh, mentors, guidance, and financial capital, as well as social capital, that isn't. And what you have to do is try and change that. Orbiting 250 miles above, the space station provides us with the ultimate view of planet Earth. From this perspective, we ask our guests to engage with six questions that orbit around wonder and stories of hopefulness. For the next few minutes, this is our wonder space. Welcome to the 126th episode of the Wonder Space podcast. My name is Steve Cole, and over the past three years, I have asked the same six questions to amazing people from around the world. Questions that orbit around wonder and stories of hopefulness. This week on Wonder Space, we orbit with Piers Linney. Piers is an entrepreneur and investor with experience across a range of sectors, including technology, media, and communications. He is a co-founder of Atherton Bikes and the co-founder of Implement AI, which is focused on intelligent business transformation through the power of artificial intelligence. Piers is a champion of entrepreneurship and is also known as a former Dragon investor on BBC's Dragon's Den. With this expansive overview of Earth, I start by asking Piers if we could do a fly past over any part of the world that is significant to you. Which place, city or country would it be and why? So mine might be a bit obvious, but it's going to be the UK. My mum's from West Indies, my dad's from Manchester. And it's a place that yeah, I think I know, but often I don't. So one of my hobbies is uh, mountain biking. You get out into the wilds and there's so many places that, you know, I've got this uh, van conversion that I built and I kind of, I like to get out now. I'm, I'm kind of exploring our own country, but often we can talk about quite a lot, that kind of overview of it, you know, the coastlines, you know, Scotland, Cornwall, the west of Scotland, place you don't get, often get to, is something I'd like to sort of be able to fly over and, uh, and, and look at in more detail. Give us a glimpse into your life story so far with an emphasis on what you are doing currently. A positive version of my life story, I guess, is... Mixed race, grew up in uh, Lancashire in a mill town, which is quite interesting. Two and a half thousand kids in school, only kid there with Afro-Caribbean heritage. I became pretty good at judo. And then um, I ended up, getting, and long story, getting into University of Manchester. No one thought I could or, or should or would. Uh, I then wanted to be in law. Everyone said, you shouldn't people like you don't become lawyers. I became a lawyer. I then wanted to go into banking. Everyone said, you know, people like you went to school like yours and don't, don't become bankers. So I became a banker. And I kind of went through that kind of process into the city. But all along the way, I was in business, starting businesses from a pay pram when I was 13 to delivering stuff door to door as a teenager to company formations at law school to film finance when I was a trainee solicitor. I was always having these sort of what they call side hustles now. And eventually I left the city. I ended up at Credit Suisse uh, when it was solvent uh, as, as, a, as a young investment banker. Went from my Milltown Comprehensive to Credit Suisse. Left there, went into business, first dot-com wave. I've kind of made money, I've lost money, um, kind of web one initially, I kind of missed web two really. And then I sort of came, I was very involved in cloud, a pioneer in sort of UK cloud. So I've always been technology, some media, telecoms. And through that profile of my journey, I, I was spotted by some researchers, ended up on the power list of influential black Britons, ended up on a secret millionaire program, and then I ended up on Dragon's Den. And Dragon's Den was a you know, double-edged sword. People think they, they know you, but they don't. It's a caricature of you. Um, but you get to do things you know, and see things and and then you know, meet people I probably would never have had the opportunity to. So that's been quite a, a positive, I would say, net net. And then more recently, I took some time out over a few years, just before COVID and over COVID. And then um, more recently, I've sort of start, started companies again. So one was a 3D printed uh, mountain bike business. So we make uh, titanium and carbon mountain bikes made by lasers in Wales. Would you believe it? And we won the world championship about a month ago, both second first and second. So that business is sort of taking off, we're scaling it, we've got a app called Atherton Bikes. 
And then I kind of looked at, you know, I always loved history. All the industrial revolutions fascinated me. But the fourth one is the big one. And um, for me, you know, AI, artificial intelligence, how that's going to impact everything from, you know, you know, maybe nuclear fusion to quantum computing to genomics to healthcare, the whole lot. And especially business and how we run our own lives fascinates me. So I'm paddling very hard into that wave. I think it's going to be bigger than the internet. So this year I started Implement AI. And the idea there is to help businesses not just talk about it, but actually how do you implement this technology? How do you use it to optimize your business and reduce risk and grow and, um, you know, reduce costs and generate more profits and more wealth? Another thing I'm very passionate about that I spend a lot of time doing is working on diversity and inclusion so that people like me don't have such a difficult journey to get from where they are to where they'd like to be so i mean the overview is i think ambition is evenly distributed access to capital uh, mentors guidance and financial capital as well as social capital that isn't and what you have to do is try and change that where on earth is your place of reset or recharge the place that I reset and recharge, I would say, is on a bike. Now, that can be, you know, cycling through, you know, North London, the traffic. But more, more so is the case where I'm on a mountain bike in a forest somewhere. So you can might be with one or two friends or even on your own sometimes. But especially when you are on this sort of machine, this amazing machine, which is apparently it's actually more, um, it's more effective than mechanically um, effective than I think a flying condor, a human on a bike, which is quite amazing. So, you know, the bike in the woods, in a forest, this natural environment uh, with, with, you know, the sounds, the air and, and the trees, that's where I tend to find myself at my happiest. My partner always says to me that whenever I'm on a bike, I have a smile on my face. What wonder of the natural world excites you the most? That's a big question. Now. I think it has to be the oceans. It has to be, um, you know, I spent, I spent my youth growing up, my summers in Barbados, you know, by the sea. Um, I spent quite a last four or five years living by the coast in the northwest of England. as so a cycling almost every day up and down the coast there. And it's the ocean. It's the scale of it. It's the, it's the unknown. It's the, the power of it, um, the beauty of it. I think that it's something that we need to learn to you know, invest the same amount of money we're investing in space exploration really to go and understand our oceans and also to make sure that we're not destroying them. Whilst orbiting around wonder, here is another one minute wonder from our friends at Ask Nature, who look to nature for inspiration to solve design problems in a regenerative way. Starlings fly through the autumn sky in startling numbers and each one is able to stay within inches of the others in groups of hundreds or thousands of individuals turning at high speeds without ever colliding. Have you ever wondered how they do it? In vast flocks, it can be overwhelming to try to keep track of all your feathered friends. Starlings manage the need for detailed information with the need for a manageable amount of information by monitoring only the six or seven birds nearest to themselves. Any fewer, and there's not enough reliable information to maintain flying with precision within the flock. Any more, and there's too much information to process quickly and make real-time decisions. It turns out that seven neighbors is the ideal number for coordination, regardless of how large or dense the flock is. Piers, what is your story of hopefulness that's not your own, about a person, business or non-profit who are doing amazing things for the world? So I'm going to select a friend, colleague of mine called Charles Black, and he is basically building a business called Send, Send.com. And Charles had this vision um, 35 years ago, about the same age as me now, when he's working in a garden centre, I think, when he was about 18, of having this this is a space, this space TV network. And you think he called it Space TV. And eventually he called it Space Exploration Network, but now it's just called Sen. Anyway, so 35 years later, it took him that long to build a business. We were in similar sectors. He exited the business and he started Sen properly. I think it must be seven or seven years ago now or so. And the idea is, is to, is to deploy a, a gate head around this, a constellation of satellites around Earth. These are CubeSats, about the size of a, a microwave to maybe a dishwasher. 
Um, and they, they have ver various cameras, and they may have infrared cameras, but cameras looking at, you know, the Earth, the Earth in kind of a wide view, like a, like a country, uh, a sort of medium view, like a town, and then quite close up where you can actually see cars moving. You can't see people, you can't read your newspaper, but that's the kind of resolution it gets down to. And eventually you have these in geostationary orbit and orbiting and also attached to existing satellites. Um, there'll be some big news next year. So think about this. We all then have access to 4K view of all of Earth in real time. Now, the humanitarian, the environmental, the, you know, the financial, the insurance, the trading, the educational, the list of use cases goes on. So essentially, he's creating a new data stream uh, and he wants to democratise space. So in the app, you can get the app now, um, you can see these beautiful videos of um, space, from space of Earth. And then eventually there'll be sort of, you know, a B2B use cases and essentially a whole new data stream for us all to use. And that changes the world, the fact you can see all of it in real time in 4K. Finally, as we prepare to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, what insight, wisdom or question would you like to leave with us? So I think as you're entering the Earth's atmosphere, I'd start a bit further out. So I'd start with the overview effect. So you hear the astronauts talk about this, um, where they see the Earth in its, in its entirety, and they begin to understand how beautiful and how fragile it is, and that everything and everything and everything you've ever known or know is there, essentially. And as you move in towards Earth, I think humans, we're, we're very self-centered on our own ego and our self. And I think as you move in, yeah, you've got the overview effect of Earth. I think then you have to start moving into the overview effect of, you know, your continent, the overview effect of your country, and then your your locality, your your neighbourhood, your local community, and start thinking about that and the people in with, with whom you live and with and who you impact with your own actions. And if you all have those, you know, those kind of incrementally small overview effects, but then eventually we zoom out over time. I think the world will be a better place. To find out more about Piers, go to his website, PiersLinney.com. In his story of hopefulness, Piers talked about Charles Black and the Space Exploration Network, and you can find out more at Sen.com. I want to thank Piers for joining us on Wonder Space this week and for engaging with our six questions in such a brilliant way. I finish with a question to you. What is your story of hopefulness that's not your own, about a person, business or non-profit who are doing amazing things for the world? A story that makes a name for someone else. Thanks for listening.